you know, I think that uh, I've said it quite a bit, but it is it has been hard to believe every week it feels a new a, a new chapter or a new challenge or some new uh, problem has arisen. Um, but we are reaching a different phase in this, and I think that that's something that's um, I, I want to address in just a second. But um, it does feel as though as things continue to reopen, that there has been a different feel uh, in terms of the immediate emergent crisis shifting into kind of the longer term. Uh, feeling moving forward. Um, and so it's something that I think that we're going to have to really uh, take a look at moving forward. And we have a really important briefing today, uh, which, you know, coincides with uh, some really hard and difficult and important and emotional conversations that we've been having about uh, disparities that have existed uh, within our communities for way too long and that COVID has, has exacerbated and made uh, abundantly clear. Um, and we'll hear from experts today who are so grateful for, for being able to take the time to, to speak with us. I want to touch on just a couple of notes um, unrelated to today's topic. Uh, the first is the elections. Um, we, are, uh, we just have um, seemingly completed the, the first count. Uh, I think there are a few jurisdictions with some outstanding provisional ballots. Uh, and it was a bit of a roller coaster election. Um, there were some very obvious challenges and some very obvious problems. Uh, certainly, the news yesterday of what happened in Florida, uh, excuse me, in Georgia um, and a few other states, uh, that it was clear that some of the challenges that Maryland faced uh, were not unique to Maryland. Uh, as everyone tried to put together an election in the middle of a pandemic, certainly there were there were some some really enormous kind of logistical uh, challenges that that had some some negative impacts. And and certainly we know, unfortunately, that a lot of the times those negative impacts are on communities who can least afford to have those negative impacts. Um, that said, uh, if you look at the numbers, it, it appears on a first run that we will have record turnout uh, of, for primary elections in a number of our largest jurisdictions, uh, which means something happened with vote by mail uh, that made it presumably easier for people to participate in democracy. Uh, and also, I think it was a sign of the times that people are more engaged now than ever uh, as we face a pandemic, about questions about our institutions uh, and about uh, society at large. So um, we have a, there is a joint hearing next week on elections um, that uh, will really dive into some of the challenges and, and, and look to see what we have to do moving forward. Um, but it is very positive that we, see, we saw almost record, uh, record turnouts in some cases uh, for people participating in democracy. So in this challenging time, that's a, that's a very good sign. Uh, the second issue I want to bring up is something that is no stranger to any of us, and it's the, the unending problems with unemployment insurance. Um, it has just not gotten better. Uh, there have been mo moderate fixes here and there, but I just, uh, you know, I, I will speak personally that I am just um, exhausted and furious that we have not seen the amount of progress that is necessary. We have too many of our constituents who continue to not get answers. Uh, I understand that people are working very hard. We've had a number of conversations with the secretary, with the department, but something has to give. This cannot continue. And what worries me is that as we start to reopen, the urgency around unemployment and back pay that is deserved will wane. That cannot happen. That truly, truly cannot happen. Uh, and so uh, we're looking at ways to uh, you know, dig in even further. Um, but this, this, we have got to see some change. If people applied in March, they need their benefits. Full stop. Um, the next issue I want to touch base that does deal with the, uh, the topic that we have at hand today. Um, this morning, uh, I had the chance to go out to Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is about 10 blocks from my house. Uh, it is a, a church where um, in the city of Baltimore, they've set up a mobile testing site. Um, unfortunately, uh, and, and this, is a, this is a testing site where um, uh, Sacred Heart is a place where uh, high, high, high levels of trust within the Latino community. Uh, it, is a, it is a very popular uh, place of worship. Um, and the pastor there, Pastor Bruce, has been very, very engaged with our, our immigrant population uh, and has been doing amazing work. And he's a trusted uh, partner uh, for the community. For weeks, uh, the, the health department put out um, uh, mobile testing sites, um, but there were not enough supplies and not enough PPE. Um, the horrific story that, that came out this weekend was that three members of the Latino community who had been waiting in lines to get tests, who had been turned away from getting tests at Sacred Heart, 
uh, tragically passed away. Um, just last week, there was an individual who was waiting in the line um, and fell and couldn't breathe and, and is now on a ventilator um, at the hospital uh, because he had waited too long to get a test because they were consistently being turned away. Uh, and I know there has been a lot of great effort. And last week we heard from the health department, but I just, I, I think it's incredibly important that we make it clear that universal on-demand testing is going to be especially important in areas uh, where we are seeing hot spots, but also in communities uh, where we know that we're seeing the, the highest and most uh, lethal impact of COVID. Um, and unfortunately, in my own zip code 21224, we're seeing that enormously, particularly within our Latino population. Uh, and we just can't afford to wait. Um, we have got to be focused in a very, very intentional way uh, on communities of need. And um, I'm looking forward to today's briefing. My final note is that I do apologize that I will have to leave a little bit early um, and uh, the speaker will uh, uh, take over. We have a, I have a um, drive-by kindergarten graduation today uh, at 11. Um, and so if there were anything else, I would cancel it. But uh, this, this uh, drive-by kindergarten graduation, uh, I, I have, to, have to be a part to, to bring our five-year-old across the final finish line here. But um, with that, uh, let me hand it over to uh, Madam Speaker. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, now to our topic at hand. Um, last week's briefing with the Department of Health feels like a lifetime ago. We have seen most of the country unite around racial justice in the last week. And I think we are poised to take big steps together towards a more just Maryland. I want to thank uh, Delegate Nick Mosby for his relentless um, pushing uh, on pushing the administration to release racial disparity data on COVID cases and death. This has been critical information to show us where we need more resources. And we know that communities of color are being disproportionately affected by the pandemic. I'm pleased that today we're shining a spotlight on the racial disparities in health. And our first presenter is uh, Dean, is Professor Thomas Leviste. Dean Leviste is one of, the, uh, one of America's foremost experts on health disparities and is joining us from Tulane University in New Orleans. He was formerly with John Hopkins and most importantly, a resident of the 10th Legislative District, my district. Um, thanks for joining us um, this morning, Dean Levis, and we will await your words. Well, thank you very much and good morning. Uh, uh, special um, greetings to Speaker Jones. Um, and, and I would point out that I do still maintain my home in Baltimore County in your district and remain okay. one of your constituents. Um, okay. In fact, I'll be flying there on Saturday. Uh, oh, okay. um, as you all know, uh, New Orleans and Louisiana has been one of the hot spots for COVID. And we've been, um, for several weeks, we were really in the, the uh, um, throes of it. Is it possible for me to share my screen? I did prepare just a couple of slides just to show you some of the updated data um, that we have. Okay. Jake? Yep, give me one second. Okay. I just received the uh, most recent data for, um, for Louisiana and New Orleans just this morning um, and quickly put together a couple of slides just to update you on where things stand. Can you share now? Okay. It looks like I'm um, able to share now. Let me just one second. And I'll, and I'll do this quickly. Um, So I always like to begin by just giving a general overview, overview of where we are nationally. As you can see, the United States, here represented in orange, has uh, began to flatten that curve. Nothing is appearing on the screen, though. You don't, I don't. It's not appearing on the screen? No, mm -mm. it just says Zoom. Jake? Have your web browser. It says that I am. 
Sharing oh. screen. Can everybody see it? Ah, there, there we go. Okay. Okay. You're saying it now. You're seeing the first chart now? Yes. Are you seeing the, you're seeing the chart now? Yes. Okay, I want to just, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is just kind of showing where we are as a country that um, Brazil has now surpassed the United States as the country with the lead, uh, the most um, confirmed uh, cases. Um, if you look at it by case per million, uh, we still are number two now. Um, the, the curve seems to have flattened nationally, but I think it's, it's that's masking some really important trends and differences happening, happening across the states and uh, various uh, counties within the country. For mortality, again, we have begun to reduce the number of daily new cases um, um, in, the, in the country, but we're still at over 1,000 new deaths per day. So that's where we are as a country. We have not made tremendous progress, but we have made some progress. In Louisiana, when the earliest data came out, it showed that while African-Americans comprise about 32% of the state's population, that um, they were about 70% of the uh, deaths. And when that uh, number was published, it got national attention. And even as someone like me who spent my career focusing on this issue of racial disparities in health, that 70% number was eye-popping even to me. I expected that there would be a disproportionate impact, but not to that magnitude. As more data has come in and we've begun to uh, be able to calculate stabilized rates, the number is right around 58% actually for Louisiana. So while it's still not as bad as 70, it is still the case that while uh, the state is 32% African-American, the uh, number the proportion of deaths that are from COVID for African-Americans still far exceeds that. So we do have a substantial disparity, racial disparity in this country. As a result of that early data, the governor, uh, Governor Edwards, um, established a task force called the Louisiana Governor's uh, COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force um, and charged us to look into this issue and to advise him on policy. I was um, selected and asked to serve and I agreed to serve as co-chair of this task force. So pretty much the only thing that I've talked about for the last three months is COVID-19. I don't think I've had another conversation. Um, the goals are to um, help the governor to make good, strong data-driven data decisions that impact um, health equity. But most importantly, the goal of this uh, task force is not to bring us back to normal because normal for Louisiana was not a very good place to be. We were in an annual battle with Mississippi and Texas for the, the honor of being the least healthy state in the country. Last year, we were ranked 49th. Um, uh, Mississippi beat us out uh, this year, but what we don't want to do is go back to that old old status of inequity, but rather a new normal where we're no longer battling for the, to be the least healthy state. Um, we divided the, ta the task force into a series of subcommittees working on uh, pressing problems that affect the um, COVID-19 uh, response. Um, some with immediate issues to address, such as prisons and nursing homes, improving testing and contact tracing, and others that are more forward-looking around policy and uh, how we move forward um, to create a more equitable state. This is the latest data of, uh, for um, the state of Louisiana and New Orleans. Uh, Louisiana is in blue, New Orleans is in orange. And it shows a pattern where right around the end of March and early April, we were um, had an extremely high daily number of new cases. Um, that number has been declining. And as a result, we have now moved um, into phase two of reopening um, the state. Uh, new Orleans, the state of New Orleans will move into phase two as of Saturday, this uh, next weekend. The number of deaths has also followed a similar pattern. Um, we've gotten the number of deaths down uh, substantially um, uh, below 50 deaths per day now, which is uh, quite an improvement of where we was. And as of this morning, this is, this is data as updated as of this morning, uh, in terms of the impact on our healthcare resources, um, as you can see, we are still um, 
uh, over 50% capacity with ICU uh, using our ICU beds across across the city of New Orleans. Um, however, I'd say that is we never actually overtopped our ICU capacity. We came close at the worst of points, but we never actually overtopped our capacity and did not have to make much use of the field hospital that was built in uh, the convention center. So the national news certainly created a narrative about New Orleans and what was happening there with COVID-19. Not an inaccurate narrative, but I think it created an, an impression that things were a bit worse than they actually were. When you look across the parishes, which is what in Louisiana we refer to uh, our counties as parishes, when you look across the parishes, there actually is quite a bit of variation in the uh, racial disparity. However, in most cases, uh, we find African Americans with a significantly higher rate of death from COVID. If I, I want to point to, uh, you to St. John the Baptist Parish, which is the second one from the uh, left. And there you actually see the white rate is uh, higher than the black uh, death rate. What's interesting there is that all of the white deaths, every one of the white deaths in St. John the Baptist Parish occurred within a um, veterans, um, veterans home um, that was uh, segregated and all white. And those, that's where all the deaths occurred there in that one cluster. St. John the Baptist um, Parish overall has one of the worst rates at African Americans, which is the predominant population there, has done extremely poorly with COVID-19. It is also the parish that we refer to as Cancer Alley because of the oil refineries there, higher rates of cancer. So we do know that there's an environmental, uh, there are impacts of environmental uh, of COVID among people, people who live near environmental hazards and St. John's the Baptist is a perfect example of that. So what this does show though, is that we do have variation. If, if you look at the green line, which shows the ratio of black to white and death rates, that there is quite a bit of variation across the state and uh, the degree to which the, uh, the extent of the disparity. However, the pattern is clear where African-Americans are disproportionately impacted. One of the new problems that we've encountered uh, and, and the data is beginning to show relates to the Hispanic population. We have a relatively small Hispanic population in Louisiana, but here we're seeing extremely high rates of um, um, infection among the Spanish, among in that community. Um, most of our work on the task force and without this, within the state um, in, the, in the area of health equity and COVID-19 has been focused on African-Americans, less so on the Native American and Hispanic populations. But um, this is uh, new data that we just received um, yesterday. And as a result, the task force is going to be shifting uh, resources to um, be more attentive to the Hispanic population. Um, I want to close out by just pointing out um, two resources. Um, one is the Tulane Outbreak Daily. This is a daily um, compilation, uh, curated um, material and information that relates to uh, COVID-19. This is a daily newsletter that we send out every afternoon, um, providing up, uh, updates. Um, the, the, the list for this is comprised of public health professional, people in the intelligence community and in the military. If you're interested in signing up to receive the Tulane Outbreak Daily, if you go to the website, tulaneoutbreakdaily.org and enter your email address, um, it's all you would have to do and you would automatically be sign up, signing up to receive the uh, daily updates. The other resource I wanna talk about is a, is a project that we have called the Skin Your N. Uh, the Skin Your N is a uh, information, health informational portal that we've created targeting African-Americans with authoritative and accurate information on COVID-19. Um, to learn more about that, you can um, visit us at uh, tsy.org. So I'm gonna stop there and um, turn it over to my next speaker, or if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Pastor, do we wanna do um, questions now or should we go ahead with speakers? Uh, have each speaker do an initial presentation. Let's let's go ahead and do that. We'll we'll go ahead and do the our, our a panel of speakers. 
uh, and then we'll do questions if that works. Um, so next up we have um, a wonderful guest uh, here in the Baltimore area, Dr. Sharita Hill Golden, uh, who is the uh, Vice President uh, and Chief Diversity Officer for Johns Hopkins Medicine, uh, Executive Vice Chair of the Department of Me uh, Medicine, and the Hugh P. McCormick Family Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism, and a Professor uh, of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, thank you so much for your, your work, first and foremost, uh, and uh, we look forward to your presentation today. Dr. Golden. All right, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and, um, and I believe that um, Elizabeth Hafey, who is um, is from our Government and Community Affairs Office, has my slides and is going to be advancing. So um, so it's really a pleasure for me to, to brief you all. I will say that I am um, a native Marylander, so to speak. So even though I was born in Washington, D.C., I grew up in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and my roots are still in Prince George's County, where my parents live. So everything going on in the state of Maryland around COVID-19 right now is very um, close and personal to me. So next slide. So I thought that it would be really important to understand the backdrop of how did we get here in terms of the disparities that we're seeing in COVID. And, you know, interestingly, at the start of the pandemic, a lot of what we were hearing is the reason that African American and Latino populations are adversely impacted is they have comorbidities, more comorbidities like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, hypertension. Um, and while that is true, um, that is not the whole part of the story. So I just want to take a few minutes to give a historical overview of how we got here and then talk about what the solutions really should be. And so, you know, I think there are really um, three contributors and that's what I'm going to go through. So the first is that the medical and scientific community have actually contributed to the disparities that we see. And so, um, you know, at the turn of the century and I'll say the turn of the last century, there was a eugenics theory that was um, developed that really defined certain races and ethnicities as being biologically inferior. And part of this was to justify the ongoing discrimination that was going on after um, the Civil War happened. And so consequently, we realize today that there is no basis for that, but those theories were perpetuated as late as the 1950s. The other challenge we have is that um, with the um, Flexner report in 1910, um, when medical schools went from being considered trade schools to being more evidence-based, that resulted in the closure of many medical schools in the United States. But specifically for medical schools training black physicians, we went from seven medical schools down to two. So after the Flexner report, the only two remaining were Howard and Meharry. And so this was at a time where black um, individuals who wanted to become doctors did not have access to white medical schools because of discrimination. And then there's the issue of experimentation on vulnerable groups without their consent. So this started in slavery. Um, a lot of the gynecological procedures that we have today were basically um, perfected on slave women without their consent and um, without general anesthesia. And so this has sort of led to this idea that somehow um, you know, black individuals have a higher pain tolerance. And so all of those things have actually resulted in distrust in the medical establishment. Um, so even if individuals do have insurance and access, they may be reluctant to seek care. I think we've been seeing that in COVID. It's also resulted in healthcare provider bias toward minority patients. And then for our um, Latino and immigrant populations, language barriers and communication have all contributed to a poor experience within our healthcare system. And so then that really prevents people from getting their preventive services and it can increase the risk of chronic diseases. Then we have to look at the social conditions and policies that um, have really contributed to poor health. And so, you know, this is the redlining and predatory lending practices that was very prominent, not just in Baltimore, but other cities throughout the United States that has led to residential racial segregation and housing insecurity. Um, and so that's re resulted in inadequate investment in maintaining public works in those neighborhoods, inadequate investment in the school systems and discrimination and high access to high quality jobs. And so again, those things limit people's access to the healthcare system, but it's resulted in this structural and institutional racism that's resulted in a poor physical context for these individuals. So we have decreased neighborhoods stability, cleanliness, there's not open spaces for physical activity. There's very poor access to health food, healthy food. And what I'm showing you there is an example of a food desert and a food swamp. 
and there's decreased affordable housing. So if we go to the next slide, you know, all of those things contribute to poor health, but there's a third thing with COVID in particular, and that's the environmental context in that, you know, because many um, African-Americans and Latinos are working in what are considered essential jobs during the pandemic, they have been exposed to COVID at a higher rate. So, you know, they are um, our environmental service workers, our transportation workers, our medical assistants, um, our security staff, Early on in the pandemic, they did not have adequate PPE. Many of them rely on public transportation to get to work. So that is a contributor to increased exposure. So is overcrowding in our prison system that we know impacts African-Americans predominantly. And then, um, you know, again, living in crowded multi-generational housing, as I mentioned. So if we go to the next slide, you know, all of these things contribute not only to the poor chronic health conditions that we see and the disparities in those, but also to disparities in COVID because these populations have increased exposure and because they have these comorbidities, they have a poor outcome once they contract it. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, the question is what can we do? And what I really wanna share are public health and sort of our health system strategies to support our communities. Um, and part of this is sort of a manifesto, a public health manifesto published by the Rainbow Push Coalition and the National Medical Association at the beginning of the pandemic. And this has really helped us frame our Johns Hopkins response and I think really could help inform our state response. So next slide. So I think it's important to have really um, innovative public health campaigns right now that reach the community in relevant ways. I would argue this is not just a public health crisis, it's actually a civil rights crisis. And so this is a collaboration that, our, um, that we did with um, Reverend Colby Little, who's the um, president of the Baltimore City Chapter of the NAACP. And this is a sound truck um, that really has been driving around the streets of um, downtown Baltimore, reminding people of these key public health messages that we need to be wearing masks, we need to wash our hands, we need to stay at home. And this was communicated using local Baltimore celebrities. So I think the messenger is important that, you know, as physicians, we can inform what the message to be, but we need to partner with the community in delivering those messages. Next slide. The other is around data. So um, I, um, in addition to being a clinician, I'm an epidemiologist and a research scientist. And so it's really important that we continue to require data collection and public reporting of COVID testing for emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and outcomes stratified by really key variables. So race, ethnicity, and gender, language, as well as the non-digit zip code. And really grateful for, um, for um, um, Congressman Mosby's work in this particular area, um, because as we are thinking about reopening, you know, in some areas it looks like the COVID rates and hospitalizations are going down, but is it going down in all of the demographic groups? I think that's important information to look at. So what I think is really important is we need to collaborate with our state health systems to accurately collect high quality self-identified race, ethnicity, and language data. So the data we have right now is only as good as what is in our health systems. And I know where I'm from in Prince George's County, there are as many African-Americans who died from COVID as there are people who died from COVID where race is missing. So I think that this is really important information. And we have at Johns Hopkins been making sure we have trained all of our access services staff on accurate collection of these data, um, not just for COVID testing, but for all of our patient care. Um, next slide. The other issue is that um, there is um, a new um, act that is currently going through um, Congress that we need to have an equitable data collection and disclosure on COVID-19 Act. And what this would do is provide funding for data modernization and quality improvement both nationally and locally. So really to address the issues around data quality that I was just speaking about. Next slide. The other thing is expanded testing. And this was talked about at the beginning um, of the briefing. And so it's important to have timely access to testing stations. We need to prioritize them in medically underserved area and those with transportation limitations. Um, you know, we, um, I'm co-chairing a work group um, at Hopkins to 
um, bring testing to that zip code that was just for the 21224 zip code and we're working collaboratively with Father Bruce and with Bill. And so there are two things to consider. So it's not just that there are an adequate number of tests, but we also need to make sure that there is investment in the resources for the clinical follow-up and the contact tracing, because that is the other heavy lift, is that you've got to be able to do the contact tracing. And we believe that tying the test results reporting with the contact tracing would be a way to do that. And so we need staffing resources for that. That's been one of the challenges. Um, and so the next slide. The other thing is protection for care providers. So this is really crucial. We've heard a lot about doctors and nurses throughout the pandemic. I am a physician, but there are many people that are involved in keeping our hospitals running. Those doing patient transportation, environmental services, food services, maintenance staff, all of these individuals need to have proper PPE, you know, proper masks. Um, this is also true for people working in our homeless shelters and our prisons who are at very high risk of exposure because they're going back to the community and continuing the spread. Next slide. The other thing in protecting our vulnerable populations is really ensuring full implementation of the CARES Act provision. And so um, this is to make sure that medical costs are not incurred um, in the setting of being tested for and treated for COVID. Um, and right now there is another um, act that's going through Congress as a support health and economic recovery um, Omnibus Emergency Solutions Act or the HEROES Act, which would really expand further upon the CARES Act. Um, I think some other important things are to depopulate our jails and provide PPE for our prisons and our prison workers. And then also really partnering with and supporting those community organizations that are responding to the pandemic. So again, another um, new bill, the Community Solutions for COVID-19 Act would allocate $1.5 billion over three years to support those community organizations. Next slide. Um, and then they just wanted to let, make you all aware of other legislation that's currently um, at play. So there's a COVID-19 Racial and Ethnic Disparities Task Force Act of 2020. And this would actually provide weekly medical supply allocation recommendations to FEMA and also oversee um, the influence of our federal response on health equity, not just for this pandemic, but for subsequent pandemics. And there was a national consensus panel out of the Office of Minority Health that was put together after Hurricane Katrina, whose purpose was to do that type of thing. But I believe that that panel is not active right now. And so this would sort of put that infrastructure back in place. And then there's also a Health Equity and Accountability Act of 2020, which would provide comprehensive policy framework for necessary for addressing and closing these health gaps. So next slide. And then I just want to um, sort of, as I'm ending, talk about um, other things that we're doing in the health system to protect our vulnerable populations. And I bring this up because this has sort of been driven in collaboration with the state of Maryland, as well as other health systems in Maryland, is that um, we have really ensured that our scarce allocation resource frameworks have health equity principles embedded in them. So we removed specific, um, included an specific anti-discrimination language around social characteristics. We removed age as a scoring criteria in our initial um, um, scoring. Um, we also made sure there were disability specific principles included. So avoiding reallocation of ventilators that individuals with individuals use who are chronically vent dependent, that those individuals would be able to keep their ventilator in the hospital. It would not be reallocated to someone else. And also allowing caregiver support in the hospital to assist with communication in caregiving, despite the fact that we have restricted visitation policies. Um, at Johns Hopkins Medicine, we have done unconscious bias training for all of our triage and secondary review teams. And we've literacy adapted all of our handouts for various language and review scenarios and translated them into the top five languages in our health system. Next slide. And then finally, to get back to what I mentioned with the Flexner Report, it is really crucial to address the shortage of underrepresented healthcare professionals. Um, you know, I um, have had a very productive career as a diabetes clinical researcher and clinical program builder, and a year ago decided that it was time for me to switch my career and scholarship focus to these issues. I am very passionate about this, and so we have a fully staffed um, Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Health Equity that's not just addressing operational health equity issues in our health system, but 
workforce development issues for our physicians, our healthcare executives and leaders. And so um, really look forward to partnering um, in any way that we can on those efforts as well. So on my last slide, I thank you for your attention in multiple languages. And those are the links to our website and our contact information. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our, our next presenter is Professor Stephen Thomas. Uh, Dr. Thomas is joining us from the University of Maryland. He's a director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity. He's a central figure in our fight to understand why people of color have poor health outcomes on a wide variety of very treatable diseases and conditions. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Thomas. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. You uh, are getting a master class this morning. <laughs> and it's an honor and a pleasure to be, be part of this. Let, let me say um, congratulations to Dr. Leviste. There's only a handful of African-American deans of schools of public health in the United States, and he's one of them. So congratulations. I titled this, The Colors of COVID-19, No Vaccine Research On Us Without Us. And I say that because we're in a time when we wanna make sure that African-Americans and other communities of color are actually part of the solution. And uh, this is my mother here, a nurse, if she were living, she'd be on the front line. And I think that we really need to also acknowledge and count the fact that many of the deaths in the state of Maryland and around the country are healthcare workers and, uh, and to really lift them up. The numbers are so staggering, 100,000 plus deaths in 90 days. That's what makes this so critical. Next slide, please. And so uh, the University of Maryland uh, School of Public Health in College Park in Prince George's County. I'm glad to see um, Senator Rosapep and my delegate, uh, Johnson Kenya Melnick. Um, our focus is on building bridges, building trust, building healthy communities. And, and prior to COVID, uh, we had we have been working for the past decade on building the community engaged infrastructure. And we want to unleash that infrastructure, mobilize that infrastructure now in the context of COVID-19. Next, next slide, please. And so this is very much a civil rights issue. And I think that the social context driving health disparities is as equally important as the epidemiology, the virology, the modeling and all the other things we're doing in the clinical setting, that our ultimate aim must be to uncover the social, cultural, and environmental factors beyond the biomedical model and to address issues of poverty and eliminating environmental hazards in homes and neighborhoods and culturally tailoring the message with trusted messengers. That's what's happening in the streets right now. We could not have made this happen. It is happening spontaneously, not only in the United States, but around the world. Next slide. But we also, and just hit it one more time, stop right there, need to recognize that there are, there are voices from the past that can guide us into a new future. And that's Frederick Douglass, a, a Marylander. Look what he said. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom, yet just depreciate agitation, are men who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the mighty, awful roar of its waters. That's what's happening in the streets across this country and around the world the roar of its many waters. Next slide. And so I'm hoping that we can agree on some things 
so that we can move forward without arguing over differences that don't matter. Words matter. They communicate our values and our beliefs. Next slide. So health equity means everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Next. And for the purpose of measurement, health equity means reducing and ultimately eliminating disparities in health and its determinants that adversely affect excluded or marginalized groups. And an effort, if an effort does not address poverty and discrimination or the health damaging consequences of groups of people who have historically been excluded or marginalized, it's probably not a health equity effort. Next. And so we believe, you see I'm wearing my Maryland tie here, that to save Maryland, we must save the nation. That we are in position in the state of Maryland to launch programs that can work across the nation. And that's our best strategy to address the needs in our own community. Uh, the Maryland Health Enterprise Zone model was highly successful. Imagine if that was applied across the country. So uh, we've launched the national network to address health disparities in a global pandemic. So here's our project goal. Next. Um, partnerships are important. Next, we have 31 collaborators across the country uh, that include all of the uh, communities of color. Next. Message, messenger, and community education vitally important, not just, we have a network of black churches, the, the Black Church Health Initiative with church projects in every congressional district in the United States. Next. And this is our team here um, at the uh, Rockville Institute, the University of Maryland. Next slide. And I think it's important here from the president of the Robert Johnson Foundation, every long-term solution must be viewed through the health equity lens. If they are not, we'll be setting the stage for our next public health failure. So we have a chance here to go to a new future, not back to status quo. Next. And as I head to the finish line, uh, very, very pleased to, to state that Dr. John Ruffin and former Congressman J.C. Watts have agreed to serve in leadership roles for our National Commission. Next. And as I go to the finish line, next, be mindful of this. COVID-19 is crushing Black communities. Some states are paying attention, some states are not. As a nation, we're still flying colorblind. Look at this June 4th report saying that we'll finally on a national basis collect data by race and ethnicity and it will start August 1. Most people think it's already started. That's how far behind we are. Next. And be mindful of the other narratives that we must be aware of and counter. Here on the far left, as it states that as African Americans become more aware of their risk, they're trying to figure out why weren't we helped sooner? As it states here, it was clear there were disparities and biases along race and class and privilege. Why is it such a discovery? And they're in the middle to recognize that there are other forces actually systematically disseminating disinformation in our minority communities saying the, the virus is a hoax, don't take the test, don't take the vaccine. We must launch countermeasures against that. Last but not least on the far right, you'll see an allusion to the eugenics ideology. The fear that as we start collecting the data by race and see this disproportionate impact, somehow will be perceived as an opportunity to get rid of people who are undesirable. That's part of our history too, that we must name, acknowledge, and address. Next slide. So um, I don't think we're gonna agree on everything and that's not a bad thing. These are complex issues, but we can agree to disagree with respect. And I'm hoping that we think big and we recognize that we cannot go back to status quo 
and that together we will craft a new future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, our, our final panelist uh, today uh, is someone who is on the front lines uh, and is uh, administering the response to the COVID crisis uh, every single day and has had a very long 90 days. Dr. Ernest L. Carter, MD, PhD, who is the health officer for Prince George's County Health Department. Uh, he has 20, 38 years of experience in direct patient care, 25 years of experience uh, in telemedicine and health IT, and then eight years of experience in public health. Uh, and so we are honored to have Dr. Carter with us uh, to talk about his experience and what he is seeing uh, in the, uh, the, the great county of Prince George's. Dr. Carter. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, is it possible for me to share my screen? Jake, I'll, see we... can... I'll see if I can. Should be able to. I can? Okay. Can you see my screen now? There it goes. Yes. Okay. Let's see if I can do one more thing here. Okay. All right. This will just be a very quick update on um, where Prince George's County is with the coronavirus and give you some statistics on where we are with respect to our um, racial um, mix but I wanna just go through it so you'll know where we are. I'm gonna talk a little bit about these, these topics, testing, contact tracing, quarantine. It really briefly, I'm gonna fly through, but I, this is to help to put some context as to the virus and how it's affecting Prince George's County and what we're doing about it. Currently, we're, um, we've done 5,291 tests for the health department, total in the whole state. I mean, total for the whole county has been over 63,000 tests in uh, Prince George's County. We're expanding those, our testing sites so that we can be sure we get to the point where we're at adequate level of testing. We'll get that to that to, in, at the end of the presentation. And currently we're moving forward on multiple fronts in terms of setting up sites, but building partnerships. Um, we're looking at various locations and we've worked with multiple labs now so that we can have adequate tests adequate test kits, kits so that we can get out of the gate. And we feel very confident with that. In terms of contact tracing, we currently have 80 contact traces. Plus we're working with the state on their COVID link project where they bring multiple contact traces from the University of Chicago, the NRC. Um, we also have county employees in training right now to our goal is to by June 15th have, have up to 150 contact tracers. In terms of our quarantine facility, we have a quarantine facility. It currently is at about 50% capacity. And we have a new project that we're standing up called the COVID Cares Project is for um, vulnerable populations, high risk residents, who we're trying to be sure we meet their social determinant needs as well as connect them to a, a patient-centered medical home and could connect them to prevention efforts. Ensure that we reach those people who we have a high tendency of some folks um, dying at home. So we're trying to be sure we get to them before that really happens. In terms of our, um, the health department, as you well know, has to stay on top of its uh, personal protection equipment. So we've been um, constantly on this day by day work with the state and we've, we uh, as well as health department and through our strategic stockpile. And, and as you might see, we have some things we have a lot of and other things we don't have as much of, but we stay on top of it to be sure that hospital systems are adequately covered and that we can cover our health department as well as some of our first responders in those critical needs. In, ter in terms of surge, we've been looking at the data to make sure that we stay on top of where we are with our confirmed cases with respect to some of the modelings that are out there. We're looking at the Hopkins model, of course, that the uh, state is following. And what has happened with us now, we've, we've had a steady decline in terms of our cases in and also in terms of our hospitalization. I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. Um, so with respect to surge, we actually have enough capacity right now in our ICU and our med surge bed so that if we were to rebound up 
we would be adequately protected, but we keep our eye on this working with our hospital systems. So measures for reopening, we are, I, we are the first two measures are about decline in new cases and the decline in deaths. And what we've seen is our new cases have been going down since we put in the um, measures that we knew were important, which are making sure that people do social distancing, make sure they wear the, make sure they wear the mask, make sure they know how to cover their mouth with coughing. And we've seen a steadily decline in our cases. These are seven week averages. We've also seen a decline in our deaths, although we've had a little bit of flattening, but we've expected that as people came out of the ICU. If you look at uh, our hospitalizations and death with respect to ethnicity, you'll see that, um, that uh, in terms of total cases, the majority of our African-American, as you well know, we're 64% African-American, about 19% Hispanic and around 9% white and 5% uh, others. And, and uh, if you uh, look at this, look at it with respect, however, to um, hospitalizations and death per 100,000, you'll see that there is a disparity. You'll see that there's many more hospitalizations with respect to 100,000 in our Hispanic community. And when you look at deaths, you'll see that the death rate is much higher in African-Americans where it's, it's uh, it, where the death rate is sort of the same in the Hispanic and white community and others. We have, um, we have been reducing our curve. We are down in the medium range in terms of our infection rate. Our infection rate now is 0.96. Um, our death rate, however, we're still re really concerned about our total number of deaths, which if you compare it to our other diseases, you'll see that it's ranking about third if you look just though, in terms of our five leading causes of death. And then that's just over the, these, these several month periods. So this is a death rate. So in terms of our measures, we are, the other measures that we, we take a real strong look is our capacity. And I, as I showed you before, our hospitalizations are declining. Our, our COVID cases in our hospitalizations are, at, our COVID cases in our hospitals are declining. Um, so we feel really good about that. And we know that these numbers have been moving in the direction ever since we've uh, uh, started really actively making sure that uh, all of the measures are put in place. And currently we have over 30% in our ICU capacity and way over 30% in our med surge capacity. So if you, we feel very good about that. And this is just another, these are the slides that we use to, to make sure we're monitoring it. And lastly, is about our testing. Um, measure was to get it to be at least over 9,000 tests per week. That's the total tests for all, for all Prince Georgians. Uh, and it has, and our number of tests per week have been climbing um, ever since um, we uh, actually uh, started trying to actively get more tests into the county. Our residents have been fairly vigilant about going and get tests. So we're, we're at the point now that our positive, um, our testing positivity has declined from a high of 43% down to 11.7%. You know, our goal is to get down to around 5%, but if we can get less than 10%, we're really, really happy. And we're well on our way to that. So that's where we are. We, we sort of measure these, do these measurements every week to make sure that we're within the range of where we should be. We look where we were and where we're going to be. And right now, much in the green light. So that is a, just a real quick, and I'm sorry, it's a quick and dirty snapshot. I, I um, honestly, I, I'm going to give the screen back to you. If I know how to do this. Uh, okay, here we go. All right, I gave it back. Uh, so, um, in terms of where we are in Prince George's County, we're working diligently to make sure that a we're um, we're able to keep pressing that positivity rate down. So that we can get to the point where we can make solid decisions about how we're moving forward. So we're phasing, that's why we're phasing um, business opens, opening in, in a slow and steady pace until we know we're at the right uh, level of uh, testing. Uh, our contact tracing has really uh, picked up. We feel like we're on our way to help keep this uh, virus in check. 
we really are concerned about our vulnerable populations and especially our folks who can't get out. And so we are working really hard to uh, implement models and test those models where we can actually change the system's approach to how we're doing healthcare as opposed to doing it the same way. So I really believe, and I very, believe very strongly, this is the time for us to try the innovative approaches to helping solve the overall problem and you know, all systems problem of healthcare in this country and to move very quickly to a population health based model, make sure that we're solving those social determinants of health as well as those behavioral uh, influences and, 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 and integrate that significantly with how we do our regular clinical somatic care. And so that's where we're going. We're hoping that um, we can make these, make uh, quantitative changes in our system and we feel very confident that we're on our way. Thank you. I wanna thank you very much. I wanna thank all four our presenters. And now we'll take questions from our work group members. And the first is Vice Chair Jackson. Uh, thank you, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for honoring uh, our request to have uh, Prince George's uh, present. But I also wanna um, thank you all for um, you know, this uh, snapshot and glimpse of the racial disparities. Um, you know, yesterday uh, we had a presentation, uh, well, a presentation by four uh, state agencies, uh, and there was a glaring uh, eye opener from the Maryland Department of Health. Uh, Dr. Carter, I've been on the line with the executive and uh, Ms. Rhea Harris and uh, DCAO uh, Tara Jackson all yesterday evening regarding the PPE distributions for the most uh, affected county regarding um, the numbers of PPEs that were distributed. So there's a discrepancy somewhere. Uh, so we would love to, and the other five members from Prince George's County would love to work with your office to kind of uh, reconcile that. Um, you know, that is a public document now. Uh, that shows that Prince George's County, which has the most cases, um, has three times less than what Baltimore City has, PPEs, and two times less than Montgomery and, and uh, Baltimore County. Now, we're not certain that those numbers are correct, but uh, that's work going forward. Uh, lastly, I'll say, um, you know, uh, uh, the surge um, that is projected in the fall, um, what do our panelists believe um, the chances are a premature surge uh, due to the uh, protests across the nation? Thank you. Unmute. Um, so I'm happy to, to respond to that because I've been very um, concerned about that because typically in a lot of the protests that are happening, um, people aren't wearing masks. So while it may be maybe more challenging with social distance, we really need everyone to at least wear a mask. And so um, I am concerned and I think that our health system is concerned that that surge may happen before the fall. And in fact, there is already some evidence and now Dr. Carter may have a little more information than I do that since Memorial Day, we're starting to see like a little bit of an increase in hospitalizations. Um, I know that we're starting to see that over here on the Baltimore side. And so, you know, there was Memorial Day and then the protest started. So I think that we actually need to be prepared for that surge to happen prematurely and really use this time right now to prepare in terms of gathering PPE and you know determining how this may impact our businesses and our work environments if we have to um, you know sort of go on a, another sort of go back from phase two to phase one for example because we do know that what was done back in March really did help to flatten the curve and really take us out of a very um, dangerous situation. We were prepared across Johns Hopkins Medicine to be completely overwhelmed, not have enough ventilators. You know, we were meeting three times a day to prepare for all of this. And we know that those public health measures worked because we did not reach that point. So I think we need to use this time to prepare that this may happen well before the fall. I'd be interested in others' perspectives on that. 
This is Dr. Carter. I am. Um, I completely agree with that. I, um, and uh, and I, I echo the fact that the public health me measures did make a big difference. So we are concerned about the um, with the recent protest and the when you look on TV and even when you uh, if you've gone by there, you see that a lot of folks don't have the mask. They're not. They're very close together. And um, we're we're that's why we're keeping a vigilant eye on that every day. We're looking at our numbers. We haven't to date. We haven't seen a, any real tremendous increase in that. But as you well know, it won't be reflected for another week or so. So in in light of trying to make decisions about reopening and um, using the, you know you're looking at 14 days prior to you make the, to whether or not to to go to another phase. We're going to these phases uh, um, guarded in a real guarded way and making sure that um, if we need to go back or we need to freeze it, then we're going to do what we have to do. Uh, one thing I will say about Prince George's County residents, they have been very good. I mean, I, I really, they, they have listened to us. They have done what we asked. Uh, and even we didn't see a tremendous bump over um, Memorial Day. I mean, it really did. It didn't. We were still on the same track, but with the with the current uh, protest, I, that's a different story. So we're going to see. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Let me just say briefly: it's how we characterize what's happening. Be mindful that we're getting mis mixed messages from the White House around wearing masks and role modeling. Um, when we saw the spring breakers, we, we called them irresponsible and selfish. I do not think that's the characterization of the people protesting for justice and anti-racism. They're taking a calculated risk for a greater good. And I think it's important that we recognize what they're doing is part of this huge movement we're part of that we cannot separate from the public health issue and therefore we do our best to help them be as safe as possible. Uh, so there will be a spike. It is the nature of a virus that's infectious. So let's, now that we know at the level of a zip code, let's pre-position resources in the very neighborhoods that we know it's gonna come. Let's start doing the education and outreach there. Let's train contact tracers from the neighborhood, people who are already trusted. Yeah. So there are things we should do and we should do it differently than we have in the past. And I would, I would add to that, that our House Staff Diversity Council, um, who had also sort of led us through our um, White Coats for Black Lives um, sort of memorial on Friday, um, you know, our supply chain had masks that weren't appropriate for clinical settings, but would be appropriate for public settings. And so they actually took those masks down to the protest to hand out. So, you know, I think there are things that we can do to support what is happening, um, because I, I do think there are two, there are two issues here, um, but trying to help people be responsible and safe about it. Okay. You can also point out that at the same time that the, that the arrest began, we see many states have begun to reopen the economies where you would expect that there would be increasing cases from that as well. So we've got several competing things happening and I don't know that we'll, that we'll ever be able to really uh, determine if the unrest was the cause of any increases in cases or if it was the, the, um, the um, efforts to reopen the economies that have happened. And in some cases, um, uh, particularly down here in the South, uh, Louisiana has been very responsible and careful in a way that we do things. But we're surrounded by states that have, in some cases, governors that have been outright hostile to the idea that we should do anything in response to, um, to COVID-19. So there's a lot of complexity. And I don't know, while I am concerned that uh, the unrest does increase the likelihood of transmission, I, I'm, I'm not as concerned as most of my colleagues are that this will be the driver uh, because there are multiple drivers happening at, at, at the same time. Okay, we're going to our next question from the President Pro Tem Griffith. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do wanna thank you and President Ferguson for bringing this important con uh, conversation to the work group. I think I've had the, the pleasure of being either in the presence of or uh, in the room when each of the panelists have been speaking. And I thank you guys for your work and for providing the historical perspective and current recommendations. Um, I had several questions, but I know there may be others. So I'll, I'll just try to pull a couple. Um, I know that we had some conversation about federal policies and initiatives that can potentially impact health disparities moving forward. I wondered if any of you have any recommendations as to what we as state legislators can do and policies we should be looking at at a state level that can impact what we're, we're seeing particularly exacerbated by COVID-19. And also I'd like it if someone could speak to the role that telehealth is playing as we attempt to address this and um, how that is impacting our minority communities and whether or not that there is some best practice uh, happening that we haven't been told about. So I'll pause there, Madam Speaker. Uh, on, okay. on, on, the, on telehealth, this is one of the initiatives that we've undertaken. We partnered with the uh, Fairly Qualified Health Centers here in Louisiana to deal with this issue as um, they move to telehealth, their patients are having great difficulty using those, those technologies and they turn to us to see if we can help to innovate a solution. And we, we innovated we come up with several innovations to deal with uh, uh, access um, among low-income people and people who are living in communities that don't have access to broadband. And, and, and uh, we're compiling uh, a list of best practices, which I'm not personally involved in that project and can't really tell you what those practices are, and I, but I would be happy to share that that with you as we get those documents. That'd be great. Dr. Golden? Yeah, and then I, you know, I was gonna say um, to, to add to that. So we, within the course of a week, sort of went from um, like 100 telemedicine visits across Johns Hopkins Medicine to 95% of visits that way. And this was a concern. Are there some patients who are not able to access that? So what one of the, we had a couple of challenges that affect vulnerable populations. So one is that, making sure that interpretation services are still available for those who have limited English proficiency as a part of that process. And our language services team has worked very closely to make sure that that happens. But then for people who didn't have telemedicine, you know, our clinicians just wanted the patients to get the care. And so they would convert it to a phone visit. The challenge is from an insurance standpoint, you get $20 for a phone visit, even if you spend an hour in a complex you know, medical review with a patient, you get much more reimbursement for a telehealth visit. So I think that there needs to be um, the insurance companies, the insurers need to reimburse more for phone visits because it made our providers spend like an hour trying to get this like telemedicine visit connected because they were told, well, you're only gonna get $20 for a phone visit. So I think that's that's particularly important that that needs to change. Um, and I see Dr. Thomas had a question. I was gonna address your question about the legislation, but if we're still on telemedicine, maybe yeah. he was Before we speak, can I say one more thing about telemedicine before we go to that question? Um, so I used to live on the Eastern shore and, I, and what I do know here in Louisiana in the rural areas there's very limited access to broadband. I know that when I was last in uh, Somerset County, again, very limited access to broadband. If uh, one thing that you can do as state legislature, as a state legislature, is uh, support resources in rural areas to increase the broadband capacity. This is a huge national problem that's not really being addressed at the at the federal by the federal government. And I think at this point, it's up to the states to address this issue. You got the Eastern Shore, you got Southern Maryland, you got Western Maryland, I'm sure. I, mean, I do know also that in Western Maryland, there's a limited access to broadband, but there's one thing that you can do um, to ensure that people are able to access telemedicine effectively. And I think that also impacts the ability of our, um, of our students to be able to get their education, because that was the other challenge, one of the challenges that you know, we've had in and around Baltimore is everything went to online school. And that's assuming that everybody has access to the internet, everybody has a laptop, everyone has a computer. So not just for telemedicine, but that kind of intervention would even allow for more, um, for, for education to be delivered more equitably. 
differently if we can't open our schools as we normally would in the fall. Yeah. So and just brief, briefly, there have been few diseases that have exposed the fact that it's touched every aspect of our lives. And when we hear the governor give his press conference, he's got the secretary of transportation, secretary of housing. I mean, a whole range of policies that you would not necessarily think are health in a traditional sense. So right now, you in the state legislature have a piece of legislation on establishing the Maryland Health and All Policy Council. And that was slated for voting on just before you closed early. How about we stand that legislation up right now? Everything's in place and three years of work group went into making that recommendation. That legislation is ready to launch. Can we stand it up right now, even in the absence of the governor signing a piece of law? I would highly recommend we figure out how to do that. We're not back in session, but um, uh, Jake, if you can um, unmute Dr. Carter, he's been trying to. Yeah, we're trying to figure out what, there we go. There we are. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, uh, there's a lot of things that can be done on the telemedicine side, but I think everybody really touched on it. But even whether you're in the rural or whether you're inside the city, there's a lot of very low bandwidth areas, especially in inside our urban uh, things. And, and when we tried to do telemedicine um, in, uh, in, in the district, we found that we had to do a lot of work just trying to get a, a decent signal to do the type of telemedicine that you really wanna do. But having said that, this is the golden age of telemedicine. Not only uh, doing the consultations, which this is this is sort of sparked the, the uh, physician to patient consultation more than the other aspects, but it's gonna be much more uh, remote monitoring, being able to use devices within the home. Um, the video, the video conferencing enhances that, as you all well know, but it'll also be a time for, uh, for physician to specialist and specialist to physician. But, but all of that has to be integrated into a total system of care because it's not a one-off. Telemedicine is just a tool for a physician to use to do to practice medicine. But the, but the entire health information um, infrastructure needs to be built, and it, it doesn't need to be built based on uh, who can afford it. It has to be built so that it can reach everybody. And that's what our problem right now. We, when we build systems, we don't build systems to meet everybody. We, we build them with respect to the profitability of, of a company. And that's not going to work moving forward in our healthcare system. It ha in order to be equitable, it has to be accessible. And so when, it, when, you, when we talk telemedicine, we want to be sure that, that all the people are on board and our, and our state legislators can make sure of this. Verizon, um, all, you know, Comcast, all of the, uh, the, the, uh, the people who can supply broadband, there should be a minimum amount of broadband into each home, period. And, instead of somebody saying we've got to pay, there just needs to be a minimum amount because it's, it's like a highway. Uh, you need it. it that's, they don't call it the information highway for nothing. So you, you can drive along the highway in your car, you should be able to connect to the, to the internet with sufficient broadband to be able to do telemedicine in particular. All right, thank you very much. And that whole issue of broadband, uh, the legislator has taken it up in terms of uh, express. I think we sent out letters several, a couple of months ago. So that's something that is on the forefront. And, and also those who cannot uh, have access to laptop because of broadband. Yeah, that has been on. So we're, I see we're all on the same page on that, so. Okay, and I see the last hand up, Vice Chair Pena Melman. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and good morning, everyone. So my question is actually for all the presenters, if they can quickly, what has been your relationship with the office of my, the State Office of Minority Health? Have you shared any data with them? Have they shared any data with you? Um, at all. And as we 
think about the 2021 session, do you see any possible legislation dealing with data sh sharing in the Medicaid population where we have 1.3 million people, 600 of them children in the state of Maryland? Um, thank you so much. Well, I can, this is Dr. Carter. Um, we just recently started to work with the, uh, the Department of Minority Health at the state. Uh, we, we created a vulnerable patients population uh, project called COVID Care. They, we presented that to them and now they're working with us on that. Um, so I will, and, and we'll see how that progresses. Uh, I think there's a lot that can be done through that department that could help uh, not, not only Prince George's County, but the state in general. Um, I think that uh, there is, it needs to be totally integrated into, uh, into a population health model. Um, I, and I don't know where that is, but I know that, that that's, that's just my feeling. Um, but but we, have, we, have, we are working with the Department of, of Minority Health. Um, I, think, I do think though that we did do the, the uh, Health Enterprise Zone project, which was sponsored through the, the department and it lost funding and it went by the wayside and it was successful as Dr. Thomas said. Uh, so we've had these, there's so many projects like the Health Enterprise Zone that, that you show positive results, you show how it could work, work and where it's progressing to, and then the funding runs out. So we, we really believe that, uh, and I know you all will help us with this. There needs to be infrastructure money like money that went toward the health enterprise on the later foundation for making sure that people who need have extra social determinant needs get those, get that help, and that we have a floor that you can't go below, that there is a, you're going to get this much health care no matter what. And um, and that's what we're we're trying to achieve. I think that with this COVID crisis, if if our state can move toward that, making sure, we're making sure that, they, that we have an all payer model for the hospital. We need, an, we need to have an all payer model. We need to have a model that makes sure that nobody falls below. And, I, I, and, I, and I'll leave it at that. And, and that, that includes how we deal with our Medi Medicaid money. And I, and I, cause I hear what you're saying. And I think there's a lot of discussion around that, but I'll let other folks. Yeah, I, I'd like to speak to the Office of Minority Health issue. In, in my role as chair of, the, of Louisiana's task force, we've been reaching out to other state task forces around the country, uh, creating a national network of these COVID-19 health equity task forces so that we can share experiences, share best practices and learn from each other. And as I reached out, as I've been reaching out to my counterparts and talking to them about how they're structured, I have noticed that in many cases, the Office of Minority Health, the State Office of Minority Health is not a part of the task force, is not paying a central role. Now in our case, the chair of the, the head of the of our Office of Health Equity in Louisiana is a member of the task force, but I note that he's not the chair. I am the chair of, the, of that task force. And you would think that the expertise, you would think the expertise to run a chair or committee like that for a state would reside within the Office of Minority Health and that I think he would be highly qualified to the chair. Now, I've also talked to Noel Braithwaite, uh, Maryland's OMH, uh, Office of Minority Health um, and Health Equity uh, Director. Um, and so he and I have talked, we've talked about data sharing and things that we can do together, but that was more a matter of my personal relationship with him and the fact that we are looking to work together on things related to COVID. The way that these office, offices have been positioned it has, is troubling. They were created uh, mostly during the Obama administration for the purpose of having a focus on racial disparities in health and health equity. Um, they are populated, at least among all of the state offices that I, that I know, and I know a number of them, they're all populated by qualified people that have expertise and, and could bring a lot to bear. They're, in most cases, they are a part of the executive branch of the government, which allows them the ability, should allow them the ability to access the resources of the executive branch. But I'm finding across the nation that there is variation. In Maryland, you do have uh, an office that is part of the executive branch, but 
quite frankly, and, I, and, I, and I'm not just, uh, I'm not uh, sort of speaking about any private conversations I've had with, with Noel, but I will say he appears to, and this is my perception, not what he said. My perception is that he appears to be somewhat hamstrung and limited in his ability to really push an agenda for health equity in the way that I know he would if he had the resources and ability to do that. And I think a closer relationship between him and the legislative branch would be helpful if it could be done in a way that would not compromise his ability to continue to be effective within the executive branch. Okay. Dr. Thomas. And just briefly, I think the voice of public health has been muzzled across the country. And so we typically would look to our friends at the Centers for Disease Control. We're not hearing from them. We probably haven't heard anything from the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. So there's a lot of expertise that's been muzzled. And I think we have to figure out a way of unleashing that as we move forward. It's a problem across the board well, Stephen, I've talked to the Office of Minority Health Director at, at CDC. Just the other night we talked. I've talked to the head of uh, NIMHD as well, uh, Aliseo, Aliseo, as well as uh, Leandris. They are both doing a lot. They actually have quite a big agenda. But I mean, the, the, the elephant in the room here that we're not discussing is the fact that the national executive branch of the, of the federal, national government has not been engaged and has in many ways limited their ability to be effective, but they are both finding creative ways to have an impact within the context of the political reality that they're dealing with uh, being part of this administration. And I, and, and I just wanna add, um, you know, in thinking about, um, you know, organizational responses to this pandemic, and, and, and I think it's any, any crisis, because quite frankly, you know, from my perspective, I'm a diabetologist, we had a public health crisis going on before COVID hit, it just killed people more slowly. This is just killing people quickly and making mm -hmm. it more obvious. And I think that one of the things that, you know, I've sort of helped my organization to grow to understand is that health equity issues around diversity and inclusion are not just, this is something we do on the side, but it needs to be integrated into every operational decision that we make, everything that we're doing clinically. And so I think that we often don't think of it that way. And so because I have my grandmother's like sort of the Southern Virginia stubbornness and resolve, I just pushed my way right into every operational decision that was being made around COVID. And now, of course, now I can have like 200 emails a day, but it is better for it to be that way because I think that those of us who are involved in those communities, who've done the research, who've done the care, we need to take how do we know what's been done for in research, and Dr. LaVista and Dr. Thomas have done a lot of research in this area, integrated into clinical practice, integrated into operations, and integrated into legislation and policy. And so we need to be at all of those tables. They should not be a special, you know, minority task force. There needs to be, you know, a health equity task force that includes everybody or it's a part of a main agenda. And I think that that is where many organizations, including our government organizations need to evolve to. And can, um, Vice Chair, is that, you have another question? Is that, Benya Melnick? Yes, I'm right here. Thank yeah. you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Yes, I really appreciate your comments because I think that the Office of Minority Health um, can play a key role because they have access to the data, the data that you don't have and we don't have, and they have access to the Medicaid data as well. And if I may offline, will you be so kind, and I know I've been in touch with some of you already, to give some thought as to what possible legislation you would envision regarding reporting in some programs for the 2021 session to be able to give us some guidance. And thank you very much for your time. Yeah, I'd be happy to assist with that. Thank you very much. Um, I think I do not see any other hands raised. Um, I'm gonna and I want to thank all four of our presenters have been very, very enlightening. I know there's gonna be some uh, follow up with you, you know, offline. And I just wanna thank you for taking the time today.
Um, for our work group members, we want you to make sure you check the hearing schedule on the Maryland General Assembly website for our com committee meetings. And our next meeting will be scheduled for June 24th at 10 a.m. So there's a little gap there. And in terms of a um, wrap up remarks, um, these last 10 days have exposed some of the biggest challenges facing our communities and the future of this country. But this time has also shown us the resilience of our constituents, the leadership of our young people and ideas for a path forward to eliminate racial injustice. I hope that Maryland is a leader in this national conversation. As we heard today, system injustices is not just reflected in criminal justice reform. Systemic equality means access and support in hospitals and doctor's offices for preventive care and in a pandemic. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. This was a timely and important session. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.